right, welcome everyone um, to our webinar. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, so we're going to, um, we've got a group of um, great educators here. Um, we're gonna talk about uh, how to make virtual lectures engaging. My name is Andy King. I'm a um, associate professor and uh, associate program director at Ohio State. And uh, we'll kind of send it around to the, to the group to introduce themselves. Hey everyone, I'm Mike Gottlieb. I'm an associate professor as well as the Elson Division Director and the Elson Fellowship Program Director at Rush in Chicago. I'm Christine Kolstad, also associate professor and clerkship director at UT Southwestern in Dallas. Awesome. Hey, I'm, I'm Serena Nation. I'm APD at Duke University. I'm Jessica Nelson. I'm an assistant professor at WashU and the APD for our Critical Care Fellowship. Hey everyone, I'm Ryan Pettigo. I'm one of the associate program directors at Harbor UCLA Medical Center. Hey everyone, I'm Olaf Shaw. I'm one of the um, Olshan Fellowship Directors at MUSC, assistant professor. All right, thanks everyone for the for the introductions. Um, Jessica, you want to take us um, to get started? Absolutely. Am I able to advance the slides or there we go. Um, so to get started, we would really like to practice what we preach first. Uh, so if you are able to have your video on, if you're comfortable with that, we would appreciate that. We love looking at faces and not just uh, black boxes. Um, and we encourage you when you're giving virtual presentations to ask the same of your audience. Uh, we appreciate if you mute yourself when not talking or asking a question specifically. Uh, and feel free to ask away. This is really meant to be, again, an interactive uh, discussion for the most part. We'll have a couple slides uh, here and there, but for the most part, we'll be doing a panel discussion. So feel free to ask your questions verbally or in the chat. You can do the raise hand option as well, whatever you are most comfortable with. And Andy will call on you. So as far as the goals for this presentation, uh, we want to utilize novel tools to enhance teaching for you. So uh, we will be demonstrating a couple of those tools and we're hopeful that everybody walks away from this presentation with at least one new thing to use in your lectures. Um, and the really the overarching goal is in this new pandemic world, uh, which seems to be stretching on and on to really learn how to adapt our teaching now to a virtual environment since uh, virtual is so integrated in education and will continue to be for the foreseeable future. So the three pillars of presentation Zen that we want to start with um, and focus on are number one, restraint in presentation. So avoid things like too many animations in your presentations, too many bells or whistles. Uh, we want simplicity in the design of a presentation. Focus on the message uh, and keep your slide design and backgrounds overall fairly simple and cohesive throughout the presentation. And the last pillar of our presentation Zen is naturalness in delivery of a presentation, keeping things overall fairly conversational, varying your tone, not reading off your slides, um, really expanding on and keeping everything in your bullet points and your wording on slides simple. And so Ryan will kind of go through an example of this now. Great, thanks so much. Yeah, and you know, this slide could have been put on any sort of thing, whether it's in person or virtual in terms of how to make your slide design better for learners, but this is really amplified in the virtual format because a lot of people might be joining your Zoom from a tablet, from a phone, and if you have these busy slides, now all of a sudden they're going to be trying to read what you're writing on a smaller device and not paying attention to what you're saying, and so it's really easy to lose learner engagement on these, and so if you have a slide like this, 
um, this probably is not going to work out very well. And so again, kind of going with that presentation Zen, really distilling it down to what is it that the learner actually needs to see on that slide versus hear as you as a speaker. So if you then take this same information and then move it to the next slide, this would be an example of a way that you could actually make this a little bit simpler for people on devices of different screens, of different resolutions, and also um, you know, keep their attention for the things they really need to know. So if you're gonna assess an LVAD, for instance, this is from one of the talks um, that one of my colleagues, uh, Man Manny Singh gives. Um, basically, what you need to know as a learner is one, what an LVAD looks like, because maybe you have never seen an LVAD before and you might actually even talk about each of these things. And we can talk about using annotation later um, to kind of drive interactiveness with this slide. But then when a learner sees this slide, they're gonna take away, if there's an alarm, these are the things I gotta check. And then they can listen to the speaker to really get the nuances um, of how each of these things can be managed. Um, and then I'm going to pass it on to, uh, to Christine to talk a little bit about some various engagement strategies, um, starting with uh, breakout rooms. That was, that was a really great recap on how to make a good talk, right, virtual or in person. Um, but I think we've all been in the experience where you put a lot of time and effort into putting a really good talk together, and then you're sitting in your office or your dining room or whatever, and you're lecturing at a computer screen and maybe your dog, and you're not sure if anyone is paying attention at all. So what can we do to actually get engagement and have a two-way conversation, which is what we're hoping to always have with uh, adult learners. Um, and the next slide is on breakout rooms. So we've probably all been uh, a participant in breakout rooms, but maybe not everyone has used them before. We're not gonna go over the mechanics of using it. There's great videos available online for that. I do highly encourage you to practice it ahead of time, right? So we've all been in the meeting where the host can't get things to work. And that is a great way to kill learner engagement, uh, not, not build it. Um, so do that very briefly if you've not used them before, like been the host and using them before. If you have a large group, you either need to let Zoom randomly assign people into rooms or you need to pre-assign them. Um, pre-assigning is much better if you have learners of different levels, say, or if you really need people to be in certain uh, groups, not in other groups. If you're going to do that, you have to have the email of the account that the person is going to sign in with Zoom. So that works well for like closed systems like residencies or medical schools. Um, ideally, probably want like four or five people in a Zoom room, anything bigger than that. And it gets to the like, who's gonna talk? You know, it, it's a little bit uh, unwieldy. And you wanna make sure that it's a safe space. So if it's your residency, everybody knows each other and they're probably pretty comfortable talking in front of each other. But if they're strangers, you might wanna set ground rules and just know it's a safe space that everyone's voice should be respected and heard. Um, and then consider what you want to accomplish in the group. Uh, generally, it works well, like if I teach you something, I'm going to teach you how to read EKGs. Now you're going to go into a breakout room and you're going to practice doing EKGs with each other. Or um, we're going to all brainstorm or come up with some sort of plan for the future. So we don't have enough nurses in our hospital. This is a faculty meeting. Let's go into breakout rooms and think about how we can still see patients without enough nurses. This slide is a great example of having clear goals. So you don't just throw people in a room and say, discuss ED throughput, and no one knows exactly what they're supposed to talk about. And then it has a time limit. So that's really helpful. If you have tons of manpower for your presentation, then getting a facilitator for each room would be ideal. So they can kind of guide the conversation. That usually doesn't work in real life. Um, so if you want them to report back to the main group, then making sure that one of your goals is identify a reporter so that when you come back together, everyone's not just like, wait, am I supposed to talk? Are you supposed to talk? Um, so we're gonna go back to the panel now and have everyone share their other tips and tricks for using breakout rooms well, or maybe even things to avoid. Yeah, thanks, Christine. Um, so, you know, kind of um, asking the panel, uh, Christine uh, um, laid out some, you know, good examples on, on how to incorporate breakout rooms. Um, maybe you guys could uh, each, you know, share an anecdote on uh, how you um, have incorporated uh, breakout rooms into your uh, Zoom sessions in order to make them more engaging. 
I think one of the things that uh, Christine said is if you have facilitators for every room, I think that's ideal. And so sometimes for resident conference, you can totally do that when you're assigning them because you're going to have faculty who probably also logged on. And that way, you know, there's kind of an expectation of participation that's monitored by someone. Um, I've also had the situation where I've given rounds for another institution and I didn't necessarily have faculty um, who could go into every room. And then I just tell them before I start the breakout room, I'm just going to be popping in from room to room to ask, you know, to answer questions. And, and just hearing that basically means like if they're in like a little silo with their friends, you know, they actually have to do something because at any point I can just like kind of like sneak into their room and, uh, and, and then, you know, usually they're actually going to be on task. And so when you're in the big room, it's really easy to be inactive and just turn your camera off, go walk your dog or make breakfast or whatever. But um, forcing people and in, essentially into those breakout rooms is a, is a great way to, to kind of foster interaction. And, and those could be as small as two or three people or four people. Any smaller than that, uh, you have some risk of ruin where if one person is away from their keyboard and, and camera off, somebody might be marooned in a breakout room without anybody else to talk to. Uh, and I've had that experience before as well, so. I mean, you can also use like the breakout rooms to um, as stations, you know, so you can actually have like a specific, like a ultrasound station, an EKG station and so on, and actually just move the instructors around. So the group stays together and you're just moving the instructors around. And it's actually an easy way for the host to stay on track because you could just actually pull the instructor out of one room to the next room if they're, <laughs> for example, taking too much time, right? So you could keep yourselves on, on track. The other like tip I would give though when using breakout rooms is just uh, be mindful about timing. And there is an option to, to broadcast to all rooms. So give your learners about like a two minute warning before you close the rooms. And once you close the room, there is a natural like 60 second countdown as well. But it really um, helps them to at least close that conversation that they're having before being abruptly pulled away. We have also used uh, Zoom breakout rooms fairly successfully for things like think, pair, share uh, learning techniques where you put very small uh, groups of two or three people in breakout rooms, um, give them a case, give them specific questions, and then have them come back to the large group in the larger room uh, and report their findings or their suggestions. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, some key things, kind of Ryan alluded to this, is you want to have clear things that people are going to come up with in these breakout rooms. Otherwise, they'll just kind of flounder around, especially if it's like residents who are with their friends on just talking about some nonsense. Um, the other issue that I've had in the past is that if you're going to pop into rooms um, simultaneously, just like going room to room, they may not be expecting you to be there. So definitely preface that with, I'm going to pop in the room. So that you're not like trying to look look you're intruding on someone else's conversation because that can be um, kind of counterintuitive. I'm curious if anyone has been in a meeting where you were put in breakout rooms and we didn't know each other and it worked really well. So I've been in that situation and it was pretty awkward because um, it was like tell tell us about in a you know something that's not working well for you and to share with a bunch of people that you don't know your challenges was, it, yeah. it wasn't the best. Yeah, I think if you do do that with the people who don't know each other, it's good to build in a little time so that they can introduce themselves as well before jumping straight into the question so that you can at least build like, like we do in EM, the five second report before jumping into whatever material it is. So I think that's really important. And then the other part is when they're in the small groups, also have um, them decide who's the one person who's going to report out afterwards. Because once you're in the large group, you, you're looking at the, the grid trying to find your friends who are in your group to say like who's going to talk for the group. So it's good to assign that ahead of time so that you don't have that awkward silence as you're calling on group one, group two, group three to report out. Um, it just makes it a little, flow a little bit easier. Um, I'll uh, go ahead and uh, ask an, another question. So um, this one kind of gets back at the uh, slide design that we kind of started the, the talk with. Um, any particular sites um, that you guys use to um, identify high quality images or um, how to make um, these beautiful slides?
all up made these made these slides look good so i'll defer to him <laughs> um yeah i have a particular interest in slide design but there's a lot of stuff out there that makes it really really easy um for images things like pixabay um i think you can make an account um and that's generally what i use for like stock photos it's free you can also pay for stock photos if you're into that kind of thing um there's things like uh prezi and canva um, that you can create slides online as well um, that tend to look a little bit more put together than something like Google Slides. Um, so that would be a good starting place. Um, but really anything anything out there is really reasonable as long as you can find the Creative Commons license or um, if you like go to Google Images and make sure that it's free to reuse, that would be the starting point. And then Mike put some things in the chat so people who are watching the recording might not, might not see our... Um... I've never used Unsplash, uh, Mike. What's going on with that? Yeah, I, I treat Unsplash similar to Pixabay. They're just differences of images. So both of them offer free open access images that you can throw into your slides. Um, I think Wikimedia Commons is sometimes uh, underrated because it has a lot of really good anatomic drawings. And then if you haven't used Radio Radiopedia, they also offer free open access for, I'm, so I'm an old son guy, so I always need old son images. And sometimes if I don't have it, it's challenging because you can't pull it from a textbook or from a journal article without having a copyright issue. So where you have puts that open access, which has been really, really helpful. And then the chat, um, Ryan LaFollette put on uh, the Noun project, which is uh, a lot of icons and, and stock photos. So if you need um, just kind of like icons for your presentation, that's actually a really nice site as well. Another thing I'll, I'll add, uh, I know I'm the moderator, but uh, uh, I'll add in, uh, there is a, uh, um, a few uh, color palette um, sort of options that uh, are, are far more um, advanced and uh, kind of look like uh, you know the paint swatches that you get at uh, um, Home Depot or or Lowe's that you can really um, you know sort of make the these slides um, much more visually appealing as well. All right, should we move on? Yeah, go for it. I think the next thing is uh, if you advance the slide, it'll be both whiteboarding and annotation are going to be the next two slides. So um, I would say the, the most important thing, if you're going to use whiteboarding or annotate on many Zoom accounts, they are not enabled by default. You likely have access to them, but you're going to have to go into your profile and your settings on Zoom prior to the meeting starting um, and enable either whiteboarding or annotation or both. And then also set the parameters for who can annotate, whether it's just going to be co-hosts, if there's going to be kind of a learner-driven or uh, an uh, instructor-driven uh, talk, or if you want everyone to kind of pitch in, um, you can allow all people to annotate. You just have to know what your audience is and what the likelihood of that um, devolving into, you know, horrible failure is. Um, so like here, um, I'm gonna actually steal the first thing from, uh, from Shri is that she said she's seen it used for when junior learners are like annotating an HPI. So they'll hear a case and then people can put what they think are important historical aspects or physical exam aspects um, into the case. Another thing you can use instead of using the chat, um, if you hit the text button, you can type and other people can then, like let's say, let's put in a differential for chest pain or something, right? And so you can put in, you know, yeah, pulmonary embolism. And then that way, if someone's not necessarily looking at the chat, somebody else put ACS, somebody put gunshot wound, which, you know, absolutely can cause chest pain in the right clinical context. Um, you know, you can use this to build differentials, build management plans, um, or you can even build a whole chalk talk on this. Um, and you can scaffold based on, on images and things like that as well. And so, um, you know, there's, this is one way to make it interactive and you can either um, have each individual entry ascribed to a person. Like here, as soon as somebody writes something, you can see their name pops up next to it. You can also hide the names if you think that um, having it named is going to decrease learner engagement. Um, and so there is a little bit of a learning curve associated with this, um, but it's kind of a fun way to break the monotony and get someone actually engaged physically with, uh, with the content. I would say that um, this I probably use a little bit less. Um, however, the next, um, you know, if you go to the next slide on annotation, annotation is really powerful for things. You've probably heard a Zoom talk where like, well, you can see on this x-ray, like if you look at the distal radius, but a little bit before, you know, um, you know, that in this case, you can actually just 
either annotate yourself, which makes the slide dynamic in and of itself, or you can have learners annotate, right? So um, you could say, oh, circle the pathology. It looks like somebody has already done that for me, the hyperdense uh, MCA sign. Thanks, Shri. Um, and so you can use this for ortho x-rays, CT images, ultrasounds. If you can, you can outline the gallbladder wall. If you want to talk about measuring gallbladder wall thickness, you can point to pericholecystic fluid. Um, you know, in an ortho, you can point to fractures. Um, you can have people identify with stamps. So there's a stamp feature where you can put, you know, like a little heart or something like that. So you can say, oh, identify the basilar artery and you can see where people put things or identify the scaphoid. You can see where people put things. And so um, annotation, I think, actually works very, very well um, in lectures where ordinarily you would want people to interact with the content uh, a little bit more. So um, you know, we can chat a little bit about um, when other people have used either annotation or whiteboarding, but this is something that I use relatively frequently in talks because I think it's a, it's a fun way to get learners um, to participate. Awesome. So then just to kind of build on that. So I, I think, you know, after 20, 21 months in this uh, pandemic, you know, it gets a little bit uh, daunting. We've all sat through those virtual, you know, meetings that drag on endlessly. So really, you know, using the whiteboarding annotation um, can really help to enhance your lectures. But we can also build on that with the, you know, the element of gamification. So gamification is really, you know, the application of the typical elements of gaming, like scorekeeping, competition, and really roles of play, but using that to actually enhance other areas of activity. So for us, you know, getting our learners engaged and actually like engaging with the information that we're trying to teach them. So I think the one thing we can all agree with is that we all want to win, right? So gamification really utilizes that to promote collaboration, this interaction, and just allows that competitive spirit to really flow. So a few simple ways that you can really add gamification to your talks could be things like Jeopardy, and actually the teams actually use that raise hand feature in Zoom to answer a question. You could have bingo cards, for example, and, and pose questions and have a prize at the end of that. Um, competition is really a, a great way to add gamification. So like I mentioned before, with the breakout rooms, you can actually have your instructors have a score sheet for each of the teams and really, you know, curate those scores at the end to see like who is the winner who got the which team did the best even like trivia games is, a, is another great way to really incorporate uh information and as well as that element of fun so there's also some online tools that we can use to help increase engagement and i'll share a few ways to use this so Kahoots is actually a game-based platform that you can really use to really bring engagement. And actually over a billion users use this every year in school systems, at work, at home. Actually, I learned this from my own kids as they were um, being, you know, at, at home during the pandemic, all three of them using uh, Kahoots um, with their classes. So basically you make a slide deck and really allow your learners to, to join in. And it actually keeps an active scoreboard. So as your learners are answering questions, they'll go up and down those scoreboard as well. So it's a really fun way for them to compete with each other and engage with the material. I actually use this for board review for my residents as we're getting ready for the in-training exam and they really enjoy it. Another way, and we'll go to the next slide, is really the online polling idea. So this is a great way to engage audience. I think we probably have all used this or have seen it used just even back when we were alive uh, before the pandemic, but it really allows, you know, it, learners to engage anonymously in case there is that fear of being, you know, wrong in front of other people. This really creates a safe environment to really engage. So Poll Everywhere is probably the most common and known platform, but there are also other, other platforms out there. A few that I like to use and have, and I'm also learning more about are like Mentimeter. There's also one called Slido that also allows the same, same idea. I also want you to not just uh, limit yourself to using this for just surveys. You can also be creative and use it for like word clouds. You can also pose a question and have your audience type in open text answers. And then also those multiple choice questions or prioritizing the order that they wanna answer a question and the answer choices. So there's lots of different innovative ways to engage the learner through polls aside from just your standard poll question itself. But I think the take home points that I really want to share with you, the practical tips would be just be really clear to your learner about the rules and the scoring because they'll hold you to it. And then also the goals and the timing as well. 
You can also use a QR code to really help them to scan it on their phone, especially for your learners who are at home and using their cell phones. They can scan it and then go over to the poll and then start engaging in that way. So that makes it really easy. QR codes also is a very quick and easy way to share resources, the references at the end of your talk, so you don't have the 50 <laughs> references um, labeled there, or even like handouts. So I love to use that for like national talks and uh, invited speaker talks is just having a little QR code at the very end to a handout with resources. And then also just test out your, your game that you're going to do with friends to make sure you work out any glitches. And then the last thing is have your reward for your learners. If you're going to call it gamification, there needs to be some something at the end that allows them to, you know, work hard and win for. Even if it's just bragging rights or like a, a round of applause at the end, just make sure you commemorate those winners and also everyone else who's involved in with their engagements. So we'll uh, pause here and I'll uh, ask a couple of questions to the uh, to the group. Um, thanks, Shri, for the um, introduction on gamification. Um, how how have you all uh, used gamification uh, to enhance learning, and uh, what particular platforms have uh, have you found uh, to be the most effective? I really like here on on this slide where you know, it's strategically using the polling to understand what your aim is. So here where it says poll before content to see what their understanding is. So if you're, if you're lecturing to a group of learners where you actually don't know what their baseline level of achievement is, this can help drive how much time to spend on various topics. So if you do a poll beforehand, you should use it to actually inform your lecture. You shouldn't just do it and then say, okay, I'm gonna give my lecture the exact same way, even if they crush it or if they do terribly, right? So if you're giving it before the delivery of content, you're really using this to refine where, where do I need to spend the time? Where do I need to do that? And then afterwards, you know, you're really checking for lecture content understanding because they've received the content and now you're seeing if they can apply it in a new situation. And that can inform how successful you were in, in conveying that information. So they serve two different purposes. So I'm really building it out. Um, and as Jessica put in the chat, you know, you can put this plugin in PowerPoint so it integrates into your slide deck. The location, you should just be intentional for where you're going to put those questions and what you're going to ask in order to figure out what you want to do with that information. If you have like a large group of like students as well, like for one of the med students classes I teach is like 120 students, um, we'll run a case, but I'll actually build it in. Like the next step is like, you know, what's your, you know, what would you like to order, right? And if it's like a abdominal pain female, right? It should be a pregnancy test, they'll have other options there, right? So then they can use that. So it just kind of helps them to engage. And then the next step would be what diagnostic do you want to do? And it'll have some options, CT scan, ultrasound, you know, all the usual suspects. So um, it's, a, it's a way for them to actually engage with the material that you're presenting as well. So it's a quick and easy way to, to build it into your slide deck. And actually Zoom has a option to build it in there as well too. One of the other applications I really like is word clouds. Oftentimes, you know, these are discrete answers. You have five choices, so you choose five. And I think that's valuable for certain aspects, but sometimes you just want to know qualitatively, like, what are you thinking? When I say this, what comes to mind? Um, and I think you sometimes get a better assessment of like what they're really thinking, because it's not, that's a little more like real life. Right? In real life, we're not selecting between five options. We're, select, we're kind of giving our opinion. So that's another way I think to engage people. And sometimes it really leads to like a whole different trajectory of thought that I might not have thought about and I may have taken for granted for what I anticipated they would be uh, thinking. I think this is also something that you can really incorporate. If you use whiteboarding, for example, for like a chalk talk, um, if you start off with a poll everywhere poll of kind of getting everybody's um, current knowledge level and then use that to inform your chalk talk, it's a way to engage them kind of in multiple different ways. Yeah, I agree. The only thing I'll add about polling is it's sometimes gonna be helpful, like if you, think about it ahead of time and build it into a talk to kind of segue between topics or actually use it as an intro introduction um, because it gives people a chance to either just put out there that they know something or don't know something um, and will make them hopefully pay attention more when you're introducing a new concept that you introduce as a poll ahead of time. Um, so, cause then they kind of build in that little bit of fear of like, oh, I didn't actually know the answer to this question, but then you talk about it afterwards. 
So we discussed uh, Kahoot and um, Poll Everywhere as a, as a couple options. Um, there are both free and uh, subscription versions to uh, both of these um, programs. Um, what sorts of uh, pros and cons can you share about uh, Poll Everywhere and Kahoot and the different versions? I think this you're going to have to have some sort of departmental buy-in as you decide which things you're going to use. Um, it depends on your audience. Like on here, a lot of places kind of like locked down their free versions because of COVID because they knew there was a captive audience. Um, and this says, you know, like for Poll Everywhere, that might change by the time you see this lecture, um, but it was 25 participants per poll. So our residency program is 64 residents. So if we have all of our residents on, you know, only the first 25 responses get logged. And so you lose a little bit of fidelity of data, but if you're doing it for your fellows, right, you certainly can use the free one because you probably don't have 25 fellows or maybe you do and you have a very large program. If you work in an academic institution, um, when the pandemic started, our institution gave all faculty uh, Poll Everywhere accounts. So if you're not like intimately involved with the medical school, you might have some of these resources available that you just aren't aware of. Yeah, I agree. Sometimes it's hidden on like the school's library webpage and you may not even know it's there. So you can do a Google search or kind of search around your institutional resources and see if it's there. A lot of these companies also um, will provide education discounts. So if you just email like their tech support and say, I am an educator, can you offer a discount? They'll give you like 10 to 20%, something like that off. And definitely just practicing whatever tool you decide to use. So just practicing it, it is really important because you still want the first time you're launching your first poll to be um, in your in your talk, uh, just because the, inevitably something will go wrong. So it's good to practice with friends or have log on multiple accounts on your phone and on your laptop just to test it out and see how it works. Yeah, sort of on that note, definitely don't just completely rely on any of these things either because they do kind of break sometimes and don't work properly. So if it's the only way that you can give your uh, content, you want to make sure that you have a backup in place. And then Kelly Young in the chat put Nearpod. I don't know if anyone's had a chance to, to use Nearpod. I haven't used it, but I've looked into it and it looks really cool, but I haven't had any firsthand experience. Ryan, do you know, did Poll Everywhere um, limit the types of polls and graphics available to in the free version now? There are limitations on the types of polls that, and answers that you can do at the free version, yeah. Okay. Any other take-home points for gamification um, before we move on? All right, we will move forward. All right, so I'm going to start talking about moderating here and pretty much what Andy's doing right there. It's really a lot harder to try to, you know, run this room in a virtual setting when it's just one person. In person, when you're staying in front of a group of people, it's different, right? People wander in, it's fine. You've got control of the stage. You're talking up there. You don't really need a lot of support. But here, I need to be able to let people in to keep an eye on the chat to, you know, if someone accidentally has unmuted themselves and decided to make a phone call, because that's never happened, um, you know, to be able to mute them and be able to kind of re reset that room up for success. And so that's, I think, could be really helpful there. Also, it's just having it's con a conversation, right? You don't want to listen to someone talking at you the whole time. You want that engagement. Um, and I think it kind of creates a natural engagement, whether it be breaking up bite-sized pieces, a little meta, but yes. And also just sometimes having the Q&A session. If you're having a Q&A session, you're you know, trying to connect with people and say, all right, so what questions do you have? And then there's silence. That's really painful, especially if you built in time thinking it was gonna be really interactive and it didn't. I think that moderator is kind of a foil in that regard. They can gather questions. Maybe someone that didn't feel comfortable asking the questions, so they could DM it to them. Um, or maybe just the moderator can help to kind of make up questions so she can kind of say, you know what? Here's a question from the audience, which is really a question I made up. But you can ask that question and kind of re-engage the people to kind of get that sense of, you know, there's questions, there's engagement, and then sometimes it overcomes that initial, you know, maybe activation barrier that you have to do to be able to actually engage in that conversation and ask a question. Because now if you've heard two or three questions, you may feel more comfortable asking yours. 
And so I think that's one of the first steps. Like, it's just, we should have a moderator for almost any talk. They don't have a lot they sometimes have to do, but they can have a big impact when they do. The next time I talk about is chat boxes. So I'm not going to talk about how to open a chat because at this point, we all know how to open our chats. And we may not always think about, but you have the ability to limit how people chat. And there's some pros and cons to that. I don't think it's a cut and dry answer to it. Um, we know the chats can be really distracting. And there's been definitely been, you know, conferences I've gone to where the chat is, hey, I'm from here, I'm from here, I'm from here, I'm from here. And you see this whole string of comments down the side that are totally unrelated. And our attentions can only hold for so long. So if I'm watching a bunch of string of comments there, I might be glancing through that and I'm going to miss a couple of slides. I might miss some of that talk. So there's areas distracting. But also, if you're just sitting there watching, it kind of feels isolated, right? We attend a national conference. We like to be surrounded by people shoulder to shoulder pre-COVID when you could kind of feel like you had a community around you and you lose that. So I think the chat sometimes at the other end gives you a community. And so sometimes trying to gauge that, right? Like maybe in the beginning, the first couple minutes, you say, hey, everyone introduce yourself as you're starting and getting warmed up. And then into it, you can either guide people to enter questions in, at which point the moderator can maybe hold on to those questions to later. You say, well, the moderator is going to collect questions. So the moderator can answer those questions for you in real time while you are giving your talk. I think you find a balance between there. I will say that for talks, as much as I'm on the attendee side, I like being able to send private message people and have little side conversations. I'm not sure that I'm always the most productive when I am. And so that might be an idea, of, especially if you're worried that people might start to get distracted. That might be a time to maybe just limit it to, yeah, you can talk amongst the bigger group, but it might reduce the, uh, the conversations on the side. Just like in a real conference where people are like having a little side conversation, that's fine, but it, it does distract from what you're trying to do. So I think that's, again, something you have to decide your own kind of tolerance for. Um, I think the chat does allow us the opportunity to really connect with people a little bit more. It's hard to raise your hand and talk, especially from a bunch of people who you don't really know and when you have the screen. And so I think it gives you the opportunity to say, yeah, tell us uh, how your challenge and someone will type it out. And again, it's the activation or just easier to talk, to type something else sometimes that is to raise your hand either visually or through that little button that, you know, we have. It's just harder to sometimes put those words out there. So I think that's um, another benefit of the chat that you can really use for it. And the last thing is videos. This is like the most controversial of all. Um, you know, the video on if comfortable is such an important caveat. Because again, there isn't a right answer to this. There isn't. We've actually done um, a qualitative study looking at this exact thing as part of a bigger piece. And it's people feel very strongly both ways. You know, on the one hand, when you have video on, it's engaging, right? You see people, you connect with them as people. It feels like you're actually there somewhat. Um, and so you get that piece. And as a speaker, I really like being able to read the room. I like that I can see everyone's faces and see, all right, are my comments resonating? Are, are my jokes, however poor they are, landing? Like are, is people feel like they're actually like at the level of the talk, are they getting distracted? It lets me gauge my talk in a way that I can't do with like screens. But at the same time, it's distracting, right? You see a bunch of people you know. If you're on, you feel your video. Right? Everyone who's got cameras on, you know you're on screen now. So you have to be aware, which means you might be more focusing on yourself and just like, okay, well, I gotta be, gotta be centered. I'm not gonna fidget as much as I normally might if the video is off, all the things that you're aware of, it distracts to some degree. And times that, for example, this came up under the resident you know, cohort when we talked with them is residents who would normally have attended conference with video off won't attend with video on. Sometimes it's a matter of they wanna do chores, they have you know, family responsibilities. They're like, I can't have video on, but I can listen and I can engage, I just can't have video on. If video's on, I'm not gonna attend. I think that that's a missed opportunity. Or maybe they're commuting from work and, and they came from a late shift and they may actually only attend for an hour or two. And even if they're not video on, they're still engaging and learning in a way that they wouldn't if they just don't show up. Um, so I think we have to kind of allow people that too and not be necessarily dogmatic. I'd like a couple of cameras on. If I can have a couple of people so I can read as a speaker, everyone else, it's up to you. And that's usually where I'll nudge the moderator and have a couple of friends who will be my camera on. So if anyone else says that's awesome, and if they don't, that's totally fine. Um, I think there are a couple ways that um, we've done this creatively and I'm going to after this kind of open up and see how the group has done this as well but one thing we did for uh, for SCUP which is Society of Clinical Sound Fellowships we did a background contest we had the best background and all of a sudden every screen was on because everyone was trying to win this and it was you know incredible first of all it's incredible how quickly people figured out ways to mean things it was phenomenal but you know you can utilize them different ways and creatively to engage people and get cameras on but I think you have to give people the option and I think that that makes things a little easier. Um, with that, I'll pass it back to Andy. So, uh, 
how do you all uh, go about um, setting ground rules in regards to um, video and uh, not necessarily having uh, an over-reliance on the chat and uh, um, kind of demonstrating uh, their engagement um, by, by speaking? How do you go about setting those ground rules? I usually designate a chat moderator, um, one of the other faculty members typically to kind of watch the chat and then at the end um, help guide the Q&A session with any um, questions that haven't been answered that have kind of come up throughout. Um, and then as far as video rules, we have never really implemented a strict must have video on or off rule um, until recently when we had uh, someone present with a vi present with their video off and then we implemented the must present with video on rule. I love that point. There's actually all sorts of data showing that, you know, if you don't have that visual appearance, like you don't see the person behind it, you're not going to connect with the speaker. And I've definitely, personally, I've felt that when you watch talks and you don't, you know, especially as it gets pre-recorded, you don't see the person, it just feels disconnected and dissociated. It's the talking head and you miss the person. Um, and, you know, calling back to, to Ryan's point earlier about having those, you know, visually appealing slides. Well, visually appealing slides, but the person kind of defeats the purpose. You want to have the per like they're supposed to highlight you talking. And if it's just the slides, I think you miss that. So I love that point, Jessica. You know, what we've done, and this is, you know, <clears throat> somewhat difficult to enforce, um, is that if people have their video off, then, you know, it's fair game for the lecturers for our residency conference to call on those people to try to engage like, you know, like, hey, Andy, what would be on your differential for this case or something like that. Um, now, the downside on that is obviously you're putting people on the spot in various situations, um, but it also is one way to basically just make sure that the resident's not logging into the Zoom call, putting the phone down and then, you know, walking in, into a different room. So I don't know how other people have, have had, if they've had any positive experiences with ways to kind of get accountability um, while not having your video on uh, for residency lectures or, or other things where, you know, require, where there's required attendance essentially. Yeah, we do uh, sort of the same thing, uh, Ryan. If you know someone's uh, got their video off and they're staying quiet and not, you know, speaking or um, engaging in the chat, um, it's kind of the the rule that uh, they're going to get called on. I think the chat is a great opportunity to like bring people, engage them though, as well too, like Mike was saying, like for example, as people are entering the room and you have that one to two minutes that you're waiting, instead of having it just be silence, right? You can actually like a, a talk I gave today, it had them type in one good thing and then the chat bar blew up, right? And it's promoting wellness and giving some data about that and just um, touching base on them even before we began a talk completely unrelated <laughs> to that, right? And um, so I think there's great ways to use the, the chat bar and um, kind of echo what's being said there. And, actually people started unmuting themselves and talking as well too right so if you create that ability to have options on how they want to engage and then encourage it i think um that's a great way to get them involved um, and then also just setting setting those um kind of expectations i want this to be engaging when you come back from your breakout room i'd like someone to speak and share that information right those little things that we can do as facilitators can really make it uh, flow really well too yeah, I think some of the the low threshold things that you can do also is kind of encouraging people to use like reaction buttons or, you know, even if it's just giving a thumbs up, they're somewhat engaging, even if they don't want to turn their video on or they can or they want to have a, something they want to type in the chat. Um, and that shows everyone that they're there and paying attention as well for some of these things that you're like required attendance and required participation. To go back to what um, Michael mentioned a little bit about, you know, the kind of activation and people are hesitant to be the first or second one sometimes to even write something in the chat, not just speak. Um, so what I've done before is have everybody 
like if I ask a question, type the answer in their chat, and then I count down three, two, one, and everybody hits enter simultaneously, um, and it just blows up the chat, which is kind of nice. And every no one can like look what other things were mentioned. Um, everybody has to kind of give their own uh, independent answer and show they're engaged. And it's also just really fun to see like all of a sudden the chat blow up with answers like that. Yeah, chatterfall. <laughs> I have not heard that term, but that's awesome. That's exactly what it is. I think if you, as the speaker, can look at your own, it, it depends on what kind of talk you want to give, but I love with students, I think the chat function is great when there's a big differential between the speaker and the participants or like a large group where they're really hesitant. And if you, while you're speaking, can monitor your own chat so that people can say like, hey, I have a question about this. Because when I've been the moderator for someone else speaking, you, you kind of don't want to interrupt them to ask the question, but you can look at the chat and be like, oh yeah, I, I'm just going to totally stop now and address what's in the chat. And you can address the things that aren't that important, like the little jokes that people are putting in there too. And just, again, make it that we're all here together enjoying this, not I'm lecturing and someone's having a chat about something else on the side. But it, you know, then you have a whole bunch of windows open. So if you have like a dual monitor setup or something else, that may help. Yeah, one more thing is a little bit controversial for some people, I think, probably. But if you're giving like a really, really large scale talk where there's hundreds of people, um, one thing to consider is if you don't have a moderator in that situation, actually pre record your talk, but then just be really, really active in the chat. Um, and that way you can answer people's questions in real time because chances are if you're giving a talk that scale, it's going to be relatively polished and just kind of spilling out. Uh, the talk, you're not going to be able to um, engage in real time. So being able to do that in the chat and being offloaded from having to give the talk in real time is helpful. And I've seen it work well. All right. Thanks, everyone. We're going to go ahead and uh, move forward. And uh, Olip with his uh, beautiful um, um, camera and uh, um, tech setup is going to uh, bring us home with uh, some tech considerations. All right, so tech considerations, we're talking about virtual talks. So this is obviously a huge portion of being able to give a virtual talk successfully. If the tech doesn't work, people are gonna immediately conk out and they're not gonna be paying attention to a word you say. Um, so this is not like the key thing in terms of engaging in a talk, but it will completely sink you if it doesn't work right. So a couple of considerations for people who maybe don't have these kinds of setups at home, even despite COVID buying frenzies, these things were pretty hard to get there, get your hands on for a little bit, um, but things have kind of cooled down a little bit now. So in terms of your setup for making sure that people can see and hear you clearly, the first thing I want to talk about was microphones. I know a lot of people will just use their built-in microphones that they have on their laptops or desktops or whatever. Um, it's really helpful to cut down on surrounding noise and distraction, get people to be able to hear you a little bit clearer uh, if you use something even slightly intended for that purpose. Um, the lowest rung on the ladder would be like your wired microphones that you can just plug into your headphone jack. The nice thing about these is not a particularly nice microphone, but it is very close to your mouth where you're talking. So it doesn't pick up a lot of extra noise if you're talking in a loud place or a common area or a common shared office space. Um, this is a nice way to be, make sure people can hear you properly. Moving up from there, things that you may not have already is like a nice USB microphone. And these can be had pretty cheap. Um, the technology has gotten pretty ubiquitous. So these are a couple of brands that uh, no endorsement in particular, but they're pretty popular. Um, so there's an Audio-Technica 2020 that plugs into your USB, doesn't require anything else. Um, Rode makes a podcaster microphone that's specifically good for vocals. Um, and then Blue Yeti, I'm sure people have seen these around. They come on sale like Best Buy all the time. Um, and you can pick those up for under a hundred bucks pretty easily. And then there's also the third tier, which is like kind of like your amateur podcaster or radio host kind of um, budget. And these are like the shore microphones, which tend to be a little bit more like professional quality. Um, the other thing about these microphones is they're going to require some additional um, software or hardware um, in order to actually use them properly because they use professional like XLR inputs. So you can't just plug it into a USB in your computer. Oftentimes you need a box that will convert the signal. So that can be an extra couple hundred bucks by itself too. And really not that useful for people who are not going to be using it otherwise. Um, a pop filter is this guy right here. Um, so I can actually remove it and kind of talk. So a pop, 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 that's pretty 
painful for people to listen to. Um, and so they make these little filters that actually filter the air out so people don't have to listen to your peas. Um, a lot of the microphones, like the USB ones, will actually have it built into the microphone so you don't need to worry about it. Um, but that's definitely something you want to like look at on the box before you buy it. If it has a built-in either pop filter or plosive filter, it can be called. Um, if not, um, there are like a couple of bucks and you can kind of just add it on in front of your microphone. If you're pre-recording things also, I have uh, mine. I'll try to see if I can make the, I don't know if you can see that, but it's a shock mount. And so um, sometimes like touching your desk or typing or something will transmit a lot of noise. The shock mount basically like has the mic floating. And so you can, uh, you can, you know, bang your hands on things and not cause like horrible noises. Awesome. And then the second half of this is obviously video, right? Um, just like Mike was talking about, like people have to be able to see you in order to engage with you. Um, so it, you can use your built-in camera. It works okay. Uh, but the quality is really not going to be up to what you can get with even like a basic webcam that's bought aftermarket. And so you may not be carting this around with you on the day-to-day -day kind of basis for your work-related administrative meetings. But if you're giving a national lecture or giving a big talk to the residency crew, um, on Zoom, then this is something that you might want to add on or just plug in that day. Um, what I'm using right now is this app called Camo. Uh, it, there's, it's $4.99 a month for like the professional version. I'm using the free version right now. It has a little watermark in the corner that's really all that identifies it as the free version. Um, and you just install it on your iPhone and you can use your iPhone camera as your webcam now. So I just plug it into my computer and it works great. This is, I mean, you already have it with you. It's like a 4K level camera that people are just carrying around in their pockets and not really using for anything except for taking pictures of my kids like playing in the mud. Um, so this is a really good use of a uh, high quality camera. If you don't have an iPhone um, or you don't want to use your phone for this purpose, uh, Logitech and some other companies make some really good uh, webcams as well that are available under $100 and you'll get a lot of use out of. And then finally, like studio quality stuff. If you're shooting videos or you're you're giving these kinds of talks regularly, you can consider using a DSLR, um, but then you'll also, again, need some additional hardware to get that to speak to your computer. So the Elgato Cam Link is probably the most common one that people use. Um, if you watch like YouTube streamers and things like that, that's probably the best way to figure out what your setup should look like. Um, because they are fantastic at making sure that all their tech works. And so if you just like watch a couple of teenagers streaming on YouTube, you're like, oh, they're using this thing. Uh, maybe I should look into that. Uh, someone asked, is the phone really? Yeah, the phone is really a lot better. Um, I think my MacBook camera, I have a MacBook Air and it shoots in about, I think, 480p. Um, but my phone, meanwhile, can shoot in 4K. And uh, I already have it, so it's that works for me. And then lighting. So this is a big issue. So the worse your camera is, the better your lighting kind of needs to be. Um, so you can get away with not great lighting setup if you have a really sharp, really high resolution camera with good software built into it that's going to be able to adjust for those kinds of things. Um, if you don't, if you're just using like your webcam on your computer, it becomes even more important to have good lighting. There's a lot of options for lighting. Again, look to the teenagers to kind of figure out what they're doing and you can just move on from there. Like every teenager with an Instagram has like a ring light that they use, they plug into their phone. Um, these are super, super cheap. They can have, be had for like a couple of bucks to like 20 bucks for a nice ring light. Um, that's a nice thing that you can do if you only wanna buy one thing and only gonna use it occasionally. Um, I'm using a couple, of, I have a couple of like LED panel lights. Um, my wife is a teacher as well. And so she was on zoom for the whole last whatever year and a half. And so she bought these for, um, giving zoom lectures for her college class. Um, and it worked out great for her because then you're actually highlighting everything that you need to highlight. Um, the only thing I'll say is if you're using a ring light or like a cheaper light in a solo light, um, it probably needs to be relatively close. Um, otherwise you're going to get a lot of shadows and things like that. Whereas these lights tend to be further away. If you look at this picture in the back of the slide, this is a really good example of like a professional lighting setup just as a reference point. So they have one light up top, which I have, it's like my ceiling light in my closet that I'm in right now. And then I have two lights, like one light up high and another light down low in front of me. Um, and that's gonna help offset some of the shadows that are gonna occur 
due to the lighting situation. So if you just add one light, you're gonna one side of your face is gonna be a complete shadow. So you really gotta kind of balance it out. Um, and the ring light does that on its own because it's a circle, but otherwise you have to buy probably two lights. And then finally, again, getting back to Mike's point, what is the point of all this? It's so that people can see your face, really. It's like a lot of cords and wires and things that plug into your USB hubs just so that people can actually like pay attention to what you're trying to say. And now there's finally some really good software because before what used to happen and what's happening a little bit now is that my little box on Zoom is like about this big and you're looking at a big picture of the slide if your screen looks somewhat similar to mine. There's some software out there now that will actually integrate and overlay your camera feed with what you want to present, sort of like if you imagine what a newscaster looks like, right? So they have a little box over their shoulder and you don't need a green screen or anything like that. It uses software to do this for you. And you can actually either import your PowerPoint. So on the top slide there or the top picture there, I just imported this PowerPoint image and put it next to my head exactly like a newscaster would. Um, and then you can kind of interact with your slides. You can point to them or what, whatnot. Um, you can also put videos in. So I teach ultrasound a lot, right? So down here is like uh, ultrasound video. Um, obviously I can't show that on this, but there's a video that could play and I can kind of talk through it while it's kind of playing over my shoulder. The other thing that you can do really well with this software is actually build your talk within the software itself so that there's no slides at all and everything is just like text overlaid just next to your image, like as part of your video feed. So that way there's not like two boxes that people have to pay attention to. It's just your camera feed. All the information is contained there and they're looking at your face right next to it and looking for that for cues for how to engage with you. Great, those are uh, um, all of our slides. Um, thanks, uh, Alep, for the um, kind of introduction on the, the tech considerations. Uh, at this point, um, we'll open it up to the audience to ask any uh, additional questions um, that may be lingering from uh, any of the content that we've discussed. All right, if there's no questions, uh, we appreciate uh, all of you uh, attending our, our talk. Um, we hope that uh, you are able to take away at least one uh, learning point that you can uh, implement tomorrow to make your virtual lectures uh, and sessions more engaging. Um, hope you guys have a great rest of the night and uh, take care. <laughs>